You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show. Rated the number one podcast of all time. Of all time. Oh. Make sure you're ready because this is the podcast where you are guaranteed to learn virtually everything. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash bcs. And you will get your free audio book today. Um, I will not do any advertisement, I promise, on this podcast that I don't believe in. This is a company I believe in because I use it constantly every day. Uh, nobody has time to read. You just don't have time. But you do have time to listen to a book in your car. And that's what's awesome about this company. They hire great actors and readers. And I think there are so many books, and not just fiction, but nonfiction, that you should actually listen to as opposed to read. You just get more out of it. And Audible's got um, over 150,000 150, titles to choose from. Okay, They've got literally every genre from science to science fiction, fantasy titles to it just classic fiction. Um, it, it's You just never get tired of it. So I have so many recommendations uh, on, on books uh, that uh, The Signal and the Noise is a book now that I am... Uh, by Nate Silver, I believe, and uh, um, basically, he's a mathematician, a guy who basically shows you how to how to decipher the truth within the chaos and the noise. Much needed in today's information age with the internet and people telling you what's what. You got to know where the truth is. You got to know where to look. And his book is very helpful in that regard. So once again, Audible is the company. Go to Audible podcast.com slash bcs which is the brian callen show and get your free download today all right everybody this is the uh, brian callen show with my partner in crime hunter motts and uh i also have big mike callen a favorite of the podcast every time i come off stage i get 50 people going what about your dad you when are you having your dad back on <laughs> But um, I wanted him to join this conversation. We have Professor Timothy Snyder, who is a professor at Yale, who wrote uh, a book called Bloodlands. And um, it's, it's, it's an amazing book for a lot of reasons. It, the Economist said you should read this book once and then read it again and then read it a third <laughs> time. When The Economist, I think it's the second oldest magazine in, in the world, uh, gives you that kind of an endorsement, you should probably pick the book up. Um, and the book is essentially, and I'm going to paraphrase here, and we'll, we'll get, we're going to get into it. Between 1933 and 1945, um, about 14 million people were starved and shot and died of disease. And it was uh, it, it, primarily because of the artificial famine uh, orchestrated by Stalin. Hitler played his part, of course, with the Jews in both Poland and Germany. And really, these two men and the system in place was responsible for the death of all these people. And by the way, most of whom were not soldiers with guns, most of whom were women and children and the aged. And to give you listeners a perspective, you're talking about the population of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Um, And they died slowly and they died... um, uh, systematically and on purpose. And so, Professor Snyder, you know, reading this book, you call it Bloodlands, which is appropriate. I almost, I, I feel another appropriate title for this book would be Madness. It was a very hard book to read, and it must have been a very hard book to write. Um, so thanks for writing it, because I think it's a very important book. And the purpose of this podcast is to get people to understand why something that happened you know, 70, 60, 70 years ago is still very relevant, why it's important to know. My father raised me, I I was a history major, and my father always, from a very early age, for some reason, always let me know how, just how horrible, not only the Holocaust was, but World War I and World War II were. And one of the reasons I wanted to have my father on the podcast is, and one of the things I admire about him is, not only is he a student of history, but he's never lost his outrage at the injustices of the world. And, and and what happened even, you know, a hundred and, and or fifty and sixty years ago. So thanks for being here, man. And um I guess we'll start the conversation this way. I'm not sure. How how was this a difficult book to write? Look, it it, it, it was it wasn't it wasn't. I mean in, in in some sense this was the easiest thing 
that I ever did morally because you, as a historian you have you have the freedom to write what you want you can choose a topic but then there are topics that come to you and this topic came to me I mean I I'm a historian of Eastern and Central Europe I, I can read German and Russian and the other languages in between and at a certain point I understood that there was a topic here um, the mass murder as you say of about 14 million non-combatants between 1933 and 1945, which had never really been discussed before. That is to say, we have books about the Holocaust, we have books about Soviet terror, but there wasn't a book which brought together the various episodes, the various policies, all of which took place on the same territory in a very short period. And once I realized that, then this became the book which I understood that I, I had to write. So, you know, if you don't mind me putting it this way, in, in that sense, it was easy. It was an easy decision to take. It seemed like the important thing that, that I had to be doing. At the same time, to talk about it being hard for me, um, I think would kind of trivialize the, the subject itself, because the experience of, of the killing and dying um, is so far beyond the horizon of most of what most of us can imagine, that I, I just treat it as part of my own you know, duty to the profession and, and to my readers to give us a sense of that. And my, my own feelings about it really aren't that important. Uh, Professor, um, how important were the openings of the Soviet archives to you in being able to write this book? I mean, th this is part of the uh, latter question, which is we know so much about Hitler and the Holocaust. We just don't know as much about what Stalin did as you just addressed. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. I mean, in many, in many ways, this is a, this is a book of contemporary history. This is a book that could only really be written after the revolutions of 1989, after the end of communism, after we had access to the archives, as you say, but also access to the places, after we could go through what had been the Iron Curtain, make friends, learn languages, treat these places as real. Mm. The archives teach us what, what happened, but also living in these places gives you a sense that they're real places, mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that, that's sort of necessary for the history. Uh, with, with the Soviets, it's really interesting because, you know, I, I, was a, I was a child of the Cold War. I was really the last generation of the Cold War. And growing up, of course, I had a sense that the Soviets had done horrible things in the 1930s and 1940s and 1950s. And then interestingly, as a society, I think we kind of forgot that after 1989. And the, the Soviet archives and the courageous and excellent work of Russian historians has helped us to see the proportions of the famine in Ukraine, the proportions of the terror in 1937 and 38. And then interestingly, it, it's also the archives in Eastern Europe, which helps us to understand the Holocaust. We, th we think we grasp the Holocaust, but usually when we think of the Holocaust, we think of French Jews or Dutch Jews like Anne Frank or German Jews. But they, sadly, were only a small part of, of the Holocaust. The vast majority of the killing was actually in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And so the opening up of the East was also necessary for us to come to grips with just how t terrible the Holocaust was. I didn't know that. That's fat. That's yeah, that's amazing. Um, can you uh, I just want to see, make sure my father can be heard by you now, Professor. Go ahead. Uh, Big Mike. Hey, 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 let, let's hear you. Um, can you professor, hear me? Let me just try this. You, you, you can hear me. But if not, Brian can pass it. Along, I, I I got it. I got oh, good. It. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, good. I, on the research, I'm particularly interested because it is contemporary history. The thing I've always told my son and my grandson, who I just took through Europe, and we went to Auschwitz and places. He's 16. He's interested in European history, so I've revisited a lot of this very recently. Is the idea that it's all not all of it in in, in the case of your book, but most of it took place in my lifetime, unaware as I may have been. But did you have a chance, therefore, to um, interview and interact in your research with some of those who were, in fact, perpetrators, that who, who were a part of this mass killing? Because it was industrial in size, and it took many, many people to make it happen. Now, we're most of those people are dying off. I think I saw something about 35,000 a month. World War II veterans are dying, but there are still some in their late 80s perhaps left. And I, I am assuming that you have you had a chance to talk to some of them. Okay. So the, the, if, 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 you, if you're interested in a book where someone has talked to a lot of perpetrators – 
Um, there's one coming out by a really wonderful history professor there in L.A. called Wendy Lauer about female German perpetrators in, in the Holocaust. It's called oh, Hitler's wow. Furies. Wow. Um, my, 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 my own basic approach as a historian is that you first try to understand everything yourself on the basis of the documents and on the basis of, of your colleagues' work. And then when you think you have the right questions, then you might talk to people. Mm. And then you use what you learn from talking to people as background. So it, it, the answer to your question is yes. I, I did speak to a fair number of people who, who were victims, a fair number of people who were present, and a few people who you would probably want to categorize as, as perpetrators, although people who perpetrated often have other kinds of stories to tell as well. Mm -hmm. um, I did do that. I used it really to confirm my own intuitions um, rather than as, as direct sources. But yes, I, I do that. And the point you make is a really important one. I mean, about, about the veterans, what you say is true of not only the veterans, it's true of, of Holocaust survivors, it's true of everyone who was a witness of the 1930s and 1940s. It's, this is a really important moment for historians to be able to establish not just the truth, but a kind of truth um, that, 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 that will conserve, not as a substitute for memory, because that's impossible, but can at least give generations to come a kind of living sense of history, rather than the sense that history is something which is just fading behind us. Mike raises a really interesting and a really important point, which is, you know, the, how these events are being viewed across the generations. Um, I work with a lot of high schoolers, and you know, there there is a sense that in high schoolers' minds that the Holocaust was bad, and then there is just zero appreciation of what Stalin did, and the degree to the that 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 was just as horrendous. And I think what's so great about Bloodlands is that you unify them as a single tragedy that happened to this region of Europe. Um, wh why do you think it is that we understand so clearly the dangers of the Nazis, the dangers of Hitler, the dangers of fascism, and yet? You know what happened under Stalin is so collectivization. Collectivization. Communism. Why is it? Why is does that not engender the same you know horror and that same sense of never again? Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm a little puzzled by, by 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 that too. I mean, of course, you know each each of the histories that I write in the book is a little bit different from the others. The the, the Holocaust is certainly the worst crime in the book in terms of the numbers and also in terms of Hitler's aspiration to actually physically eliminate an entire people. That said, there are other German crimes like the starvation of Soviet prisoners of war, which are pretty much forgotten and which help would help us to understand the regime. I think and three, then as you three say, million. I think three million was the was the Yeah, yeah. yeah it's no small thing, right. Yeah. And then and then you have the Soviet crimes. I Hunter, I was really surprised that Americans had forgotten about um, Soviet crimes. That was a surprise to me after mm -hmm. I published the book. I didn't realize I was actually doing something so surprising in writing about the Soviet crimes. Because they haven't, I mean, for one thing, in, in Eastern Europe, where I spent a lot of my time, in, or in Russia, they haven't been forgotten. They're certainly present in, in everyone's mind. I, I think a lot of it has to do with, though, from an American point of view, with three things. The first is that I think there's a certain conviction among educators that we need to have one lesson from the 20th century that, you know, there's this kind of pessimistic view of the American mind that we can only really remember one thing. <laughs> so, that makes sense. If we have to choose one thing, it should be the Holocaust. Yeah. Uh, another part of it is that um, we won the Second World War and we, in a way which we didn't win the Cold War. We won the Second World War. The Germans surrendered. And then they also, so to speak, surrendered intellectually. I mean, that's probably a bad way to do to, to say it. Mm -hmm. and actually, it's a horrible way to say it. But what I mean is that the Germans then undertook a serious investigation of their own history. You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and the leading historians of these events, um, the Holocaust and all the others, are, are German historians. Mm -hmm. The Americans <clears throat> and, the, and the Israelis at this point are following along. The Germans are really in the lead, and they deserve a mountain of credit for that. Um, but that, that means that the Holocaust, because you have a self-critical country, mm -hmm. you, it means you have a, a lively history of the Holocaust, which can then be transformed into memory, into films, and so on, which is different from the case of Russia, right? I mean, R R the Soviet Union lost the Cold War, but it didn't lose the way that you actually lose a war. It wasn't occupied. And there wasn't after 1989, and there never will be 
a moment of actual self-criticism mm -hmm. in the Russian government. Um, the Russian government is concerned with these events, but it's not concerned to criticize the Soviet past. It's concerned to selectively legitimate the Soviet past. So that's, mm. that's, 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 the, that's, that's the other thing. So, you know, th th those are the reasons that I can think of. But I, I admit that I'm a little bit puzzled by it myself as well. How, how has your book been received in Russia? Hmm. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's supposed to be translated to Russian, but it hasn't been. The, the people who have reviewed it so far in Russian have generally liked it. But the people who have reviewed it have been sort of nice, well-educated, um, <laughs> yeah. universalist types from St. Saint, from Saint Petersburg. So I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's a problem for Russia, just like it's a problem for, for any nation that wants to have a straightforward national story in which everything bad happened to them and they only did good mm -hmm. things. I, Professor, I could, I, could I ask you, Brian, I want to go, go back ahead. to research a second in the Soviet archives. Um, and a two-part question. One, Gorbachev uh, was responsible, I think, for opening all these archives and letting everything fall out as it may. Um, could, I, I'd appreciate a comment from you on that, if I'm correct on that assumption. But secondly, the nature of the archives, it, it strikes me, we, we all know, I think, that the Germans, the Nazis, kept very careful records. And once you were able to access those, you just had a wealth of information. I didn't realize the Soviets were as, as meticulous in keeping records. And so my question is, did they actually have names uh, I, I, um, on, on some of these mass killings? Did, did they know and did they record the outcome of the intentional starvation of the of the Ukraine in the early 30s? How much detail was one able to glean once you had access to all of these records? Yeah, that, that's another great question. Um, yeah, as to the first thing, you're right. There was a moment of openness in the 1980s where Gorbachev released a certain amount of things. And then in the early 90s, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, when Yeltsin was president, Yeltsin passed on a number of documents to, um, to, to other foreign leaders. The early 90s were the golden age for the Soviet archives in terms of openness, but also in terms of publication. You had a lot of smart um, American and Canadian and German and Finnish and other researchers who went into Moscow at that time and just made a lot of copies and then published that stuff. And th those publications now are very important because pr progressively the Russian archives have then closed down over mm. that period. It's still possible to get to some to get to some useful stuff, but e every year that goes by, it gets it gets harder and harder. Isn't now, that what, what you suggest? You know, your surprise about the communist archives. That's absolutely right. I mean, in general, it's true that German archives are very good, but German archives during the Second World War are actually not that good um, because a lot of what the Germans were doing is policy. They didn't like to talk, they didn't like to write about at all. And when they talked about it, they talked about it in euphemistic ways. And then a lot of the documents themselves were burned by the Germans or they were burned by Allied as a result of Allied bombing raids um, over Germany in 1944 and 1945. Whereas the Soviets, and this is, this is where it gets really interesting, the Soviets kept extremely good records. That was a legacy of communism, that you, write, you protocol everything, you write everything down. And where that comes from is the communist idea that history is on your side. You're going to win in the end, and therefore you have no reason to fear writing things down. History is going to justify whatever you're doing right now, no matter how horrible that might seem. Great and so point. the tradition in the communist that. world from Lenin, on, from Lenin forward was that you write everything down, you file it very carefully. And yes, indeed, I mean, you do have names and numbers, and you have Stalin's signature all over the place, which you don't have in Nazi Germany. You don't have Hitler's signature all over the place. Hitler very rarely signed pieces of paper. Hmm. So in that sense... The opening of the, of the communist archives was very important because those archives are actually, if you know the languages, they're, they're pretty easy to handle, surprisingly, because the communists were confident um, about the outcome of history and, and they wrote everything down. Well, the, 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 what's, what, what was amazing to me as I read the book is I realized that this required a great effort, a coordinated effort, and, and, you know, to starve an area like the Ukraine, which I think is, you know, what, the size of the Midwest or something, the, the systematic starvation w required a great deal of discipline uh, from the perpetrators. Um, 
and it th- that's what was so amazing to me that uh, an ideology can run so strong that well you know i guess we got to kill 20 million people today for the betterment of 50 million tomorrow you know that 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 sort of all those different philosophies that you can play with that that's what really just kind of blew my mind it, that, that's where collective madness uh, that's that's what sort of you know you can get mad at Stalin and Hitler. I happen to think those they were just very intelligent sociopaths who were very good at organizing or whatever. One was very charismatic. You have a great you had a great quote where you said Hitler inspired and Stalin worked, uh, <laughs> but uh, both very effective. But what the real enemy was the system, wasn't it? The real enemy was the incentive structure, the system, the ideology, the notion that you could perfect human beings. Um, and, and, and that's what it felt so scary to me. And why the reason the book is important to me in, in the sense is that to realize that any time you see a group of people or one person talking about things like purity, things like truth with a capital T, things like uh, perfection of the human being, um, you better be careful, man. You better be careful because that way lies hell, you know. Um, do you do you think that would you comment on that? Because that that was what I was I really got from the book as well. Besides how personal these stories were, in many instances. Yeah, no, I, my my ideas are very very close to yours there, uh, and, and and what you've said is a is really close to some of the conclusions that I allowed myself to to make at the end of the book. I I I, I think that any time there's one there's only one truth, as you say, with a capital T. That means all the other truths have to be subordinated to that one truth. Mm-hmm. Everybody else's story has to be subordinated to one story. Mm-hmm. And the only way that can be accomplished is, is by way of force, because, of course, we're complicated. Yeah. And, and, and what you say about perfectibility also is very true. I mean, the, the way I think that the, the, the human rights revolution has worked is, is that we've understood that each person, the way he or she already is, is an inherent value. A person is not valuable because they can be transformed into something better or something else. A person is valuable as a human being. And that seems very simple once once you say it, but that is actually a very important break from the way that these leaders and many, many other people were thinking in the 1930s and 1940s. They were, people were thinking that human beings are a means to an end. Right. And insofar as they, they haven't become what they're going to be, um, they are the they're they're they're, they're the trash of history. Mm-hmm. Um, they're just there as a kind of way to create something which is going to be better. And that's a very that that's a, unfortunately a very powerful way of thinking. Um, and, and and it, it captured the minds of an awful lot of people. What happened can't be explained just in terms of, of of force or discipline or authority. There has to be that sense that there is some future and that you can reach it. But in order to reach it, you have to sacrifice those who who who, who history doesn't seem to have a place for. Well, yeah. or at least your history doesn't seem to have a place for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, all the time I'm adopting that subjective position. It yeah. makes me, it makes me, uh, your book actually uh, made me somewhat optimistic, uh, believe it or not, in the sense that I do think we have made progress in our collective conscious, in, our, in, in the way we think collectively. I, I, I think these were such bold and stark and horrible examples of how not to behave that, um, the chances of making these mistakes again are a lot slimmer than they would have been. I think. I hope. I know. I know a lot of people. Don't. I know my father probably disagrees with me on that. No. Well, I, I wanted to ask another question. I, I'd like to get into. Uh, again, I guess maybe I'm sticking with the research for this, but uh, one one interpretation of the mass starvation intentionally done by the Germans of Soviet POWs, some three million. Uh, Within the first six months of their attack, which the Soviets were totally unprepared for, and then they took these massive number of prisoners. Uh, one interpretation, in fact, I've even read somewhere, I can't remember at the moment, that Hitler was in on this, didn't sign anything, but we don't have a choice. We don't have the calories to feed these three million, and we don't have any use for them. So as merciless as it is, there's only one solution to that. Because if we give them food to keep them alive, we're going to have to deprive our own troops, and that isn't going to happen. So that that's one side. I'd be very interested in your comment on that rationale, but more interested, in fact, on Stalin's motive for the Ukraine issue. Now, I want to add one thing quickly, because if you could comment on this from your experience, I've been in the Ukraine as a consultant several times, 
And given my interests, I have sat at the table and after the third glass of wine, uh, which is a which is a national pastime for them anyway, but uh, that I, I would bring up this whole 31 to 33 period, and I would ask, it turned out, indiscreet questions about their grandparents and their ancestors and families' experiences were, and I discovered that um, I got kicked under the table until my shins were black and blue by by my associates, and in one case, uh, a Ukrainian himself, because that just isn't um, allowed to be discussed. That would be like asking somebody their, about their personal life, and I was severely chastised for that, and I found that mysterious. So, I mean, I've said several things. The mass starvation, to what extent do you think the Nazis, once they made their invasion and captured this huge army, had a real choice given the food supply? And then, secondly, if you could comment on Stalin's uh, motivations, and did you find the resistance of the Ukrainian people that you dealt with to to talk about it? Right. So I'm going to I'm going to take that in, in reverse with, with with Stalin and Soviet Ukraine. Essentially, what happens there is that you have a grand vision of transformation. You're trying to take a basically backward country a country which is populated by peasants and nomads and turn it into an industrial country which is populated by workers living in big cities, working in big factories and big mines. And the way you do that is you, you, you physically take over agriculture, um, which is how most people were making their livelihood. You turn those people into, into employees of the state. You do away with private property. Now, this did not work economically. But the short story is that it did work politically. It was a way of removing people from their own means of existence and therefore from the basis of their own freedom, such as it was. And that process of, of taking people, the basis of people's freedom away from them did lead to a certain amount of resistance. But by 1933, by the time that the famine is actually enforced, the famine is in effect a kind of explanation of a policy failure. Stalin has to say that someone is at fault for the famine because it can't be Marxism or Leninism. It can't be the ideology. Mm -hmm. The ideology has to be right. And of course, it can't be him personally because he's trying to hold on to power. And so the Ukrainians are blamed for essentially a disaster which is caused by this policy and that that combination of the collectivization famine and Ukrainians being blamed for it is is what brings about the deliberate starvation which is centered in Ukraine now the reason why Mike the reason why people in Ukraine don't want to talk about this is because of the way famine is mass death as mass death works it's not like someone coming in and shooting you and then leaving with, with the way famine works you know, as you know, is that people uh, people are humiliated, people are weak, people steal from each other, and then when people die, people cannibalize each other, and they kill and cannibalize. So, dying by hunger is is shaming. It's shaming and humiliating at the moment, and also for generations afterwards. Mm -hmm. Perhaps in a way that other forms of killing are not. And so, everybody who survived in Ukraine. Has, has, has observed something, or perhaps even taken part in something, which is horribly shaming, um, oh. which they don't want to remember. I never thought of that. Yeah, I that's amazing. That. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And, um, yeah, yeah, sadly. I mean, it, it, you just have to think of like those, you know, somebody on a mountain climbing expedition, right? These stories where they run out of food and terrible things happen. You know, they cannibalize each other. Just imagine that on the scale of tens of millions of people, and then you've got the national memory of a place like Ukraine. So, you know, it's a crime which, can, which, which in a way lives on yeah, through the generations. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing very theatrical or heroic about it. It's, it's, it's kind exactly. of unspeakable. Well, I'm, exactly. and that's what's so fascinating. I mean, you know, I read, I read a review of another book, and they said that this book will take you to the limits of human experience. And I think that's really one of the things that Bloodlands does, is that you see, you know, humanity at its most extreme. You're, I, and no you, question. You know what I mean? No and it's, and Perfect, your comment on the POW issue? Sorry, I missed that. Uh, the the uh, Soviet POWs, the three million. Yeah. Yeah, so thanks. I was, I, I was building towards that. So the, what happens is that the, 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 mor the morality 
of the Germans as they go into the East in 1941 is this. Eastern Europe is only there in order to provide us food. Um, there isn't very much food in the world. We're short on food. We're not self-sufficient in food. The destiny of Eastern Europe is, is to provide us with food. Now, when you go into a place which is inhabited by tens of millions of people with that kind of moral calculus, you're setting yourself up for an obvious moral trap. That is, if, if, if the center, if the people in Berlin are saying the, o- the only purpose of this expedition is to feed Germans and, and other West, Euro- West Europeans, then obviously the life or death of the people involved isn't, isn't that important. And the plans, in fact, as you know, were to starve not three or four million people, but 30 or 40 million people. So the idea that you know there isn't enough food for these people, that's an idea which you bring with you. Mm-hmm. It's not literally true. You know, if the Germans had allowed the local people to smuggle in bread to those prisoner of war camps, people wouldn't have starved because the people were, were, were keeping food for themselves. They were hiding it from the Germans. If they had allowed food to circulate, all those people wouldn't have starved. But there's no question that the Wehrmacht and the Wehrmacht leadership in se- itself believed in this. They were put in this position where, on the one hand, a lot of them probably did truly believe that what they needed to have was a victory in this colonial war. And, and even if they didn't believe in that, they were convinced, as you say, that if the soldiers weren't fed, the soldiers would go hungry. And of course, every commander feels responsible for his soldiers. Um, you know, the food that was gathered in the East was supposed to go to the German housewife, right? Not to the German soldier. The German soldier was supposed to fend for themselves and then create a surplus, which would go back to Germany. So w- what this comes down to in both cases is a world in which food is actually a very um, a, a very real resource in the sense of being something which is scarce and important. It's objectively important, right? It really is scarce, but also it's something that you can terrify people with, that you can motivate people with. And and this is one of the things where I, I worry a little bit because I, I agree, I agree, Brian, that, that, that with what you said before, that we have learned certain things. I mean, I think human rights does come out of this experience, but what we've forgotten is the, the great extent to which these two regimes were in a world where, where certain resources were scarce. We don't have to take that. We, we take food for granted. And I worry, I worry quite a lot about what will happen to, um, happen to us and to the Chinese and others if there comes a time again where we can't take food for granted. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Well, I'm hoping, I'm hoping technology, technology helps us with that. Uh, my sound is weird. Rena, can you hear? Can you hear me, guys? Everything okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, what I also think is fascinating, uh, Professor, is that these people that were doing these things to each other, they all looked the same. It's one thing if yeah. you have, you know, the Japanese coming into Indonesia or whatever the stories are, or, you know. But these were people that looked very similar. My God, I mean, they, they even spoke a, a sort of a similar phonetic language in some <clears throat> in some instances. <clears throat> That's what I found so fa- amazing is how you could do this to somebody who looks, say, like your brother, <laughs> you know, or, or the, the, the women that you're, you're violating or essentially look like the women that you grew up with. I mean, the, the, this, this gene pool was very similar, weren't they? I mean, it's, a, it's fascinating to me that, that somehow you were able to – they were able to draw these very these strong lines between West and East and you're over here. You're the Hutus Russian, and the you're, Tutsis. Yeah. It's, you know, it's oh, human it's history. True. Our ability to form an us and a them is, you know – It's is, pretty amazing. Yeah, it's a human imagination. You you're, can imagine you're differences. I was, I was fascinated with how, how strong a role Poland played in the German and the Soviet mind. I mean what, what the Soviets and what the Germans considered Poles to be. Um, and and in fact, how many Germans were living outside of the borders that we now consider Germany? Yeah. So on, I, I too am struck by by what you say and and, and Hunter adds about about the human imagination. And and in a way, it, it's a reason to be worried, right? Because if if racism were only about white people and black people, that would be bad. But it would be less bad than a scenario where we're capable of classifying anybody is being racially different Mm -hmm. and the truth is the germans show us um that 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 what people who we think of as you know white europeans can see other white europeans as being like so to speak africans or like so to speak american indians Mm -hmm. that's the way that hitler classified them hitler said that the ukrainian you know hitler referred to the ukrainians as being like africans the germans actually some of the nazis would actually use the word nigger 
to refer to Ukrainians. Really? Right? Wow. Which seems, yeah, which seems very strange to us because we're, as it were, stuck in our own American view of, of, of racism. But it's possible to have that kind of colonial exploitative attitude towards other Europeans or people who look like you. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for the Soviets. I mean, the, the, you have some Ukrainians starving other Ukrainians or some Russians starving other Russians. And of course, they look exactly alike. The way they're being separated is that people are deciding that other people are are on the wrong are, are on the wrong side of history. You know, it's not what you look like; it's what class you belong to that determines whether you have a future or not. Unfortunately, our mind is really extremely capable of making these kinds of distinctions. But usually, there's a there's a there's a mythology you grow up with that allows you to do that. For example, if you're in Thailand, that there, there, this one one of our guides said, "Yes, well, all, I was shooting a movie there, and she said, well, uh, the we, I was playing the uh, the owner of a strip club, so I was in a place called Soy Cowboy, which is the you know the, the all these these it's really crazy, all these girls and." And she said, "Well, these women are of a lower birth. These 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 prostitutes are of a lower birth. The the higher birth girls get to work over in that hotel. And so, <laughs> you, you and and with the with the Indian caste system, for example, obviously the Brahmins are up the top, the Untouchables at the bottom, and a bunch of people in in the middle. And there, there's histories full of this, but there's a mythology around it that supports their scaffolding." That's come before that supports this kind yeah. of a belief system. I don't see that in, I suppose, you know, the, the Communist Manifesto, but not really. In fact, the Communist Manifesto and Karl Marx was saying, no, in fact, workers unite. There was a, there was a there was an ideology uh, in communism and collectivism and socialism that actually would suggest the, the opposite behavior that would that seems to be urging the opposite, which is workers unite. We're all of the same. We're all in the same boat. This is a collective effort. Um, yet, yet in fact, the, the the lines were even bolder, even more stark. So that that's what's kind of fascinating to me. Yeah, I mean, you, you, there is there is an element of myth. I mean, I think sometimes when you live in a society, you you take for granted certain things, and those things you take for granted are are the myths. I mean, the, one of the the myth which underlies Hitler's view of the world is is social Darwinism, right? I mean, the the idea that um, people, you know, that, that that human life is like animal life, and races are like species, and there's nothing going on except for a competition among races, mm -hmm. and the only good thing is that struggle, and the only thing that you really need to be doing in life is trying to win that struggle. I mean, that that is in effect a myth, right? I mean, it's a moral sure. view of the world which is based upon um, a, a view about nature. It's based on a really upon a really questionable analogy. So it, it is essentially like it is something like a myth. And that, that goes deep back into the 19th century. And of course, Marxism, as you say, it can go both ways. I mean, there are plenty of examples of Marxism leading to solidarity. Like, for example, the city where I'm living now in Vienna, where there was a Marxist city government. And, the, you know, the worst thing they did was build kindergartens and public swimming pools and things like that. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in, in sex education, that might have been the worst thing. So the, the outrage. The, right, exactly. Um, but it, Marxism could also go in the in the more competitive version where you think history is nothing except a class struggle and then and then once you believe that then who gets to define who's in what's cl in what class but you know that the idea that life is nothing but a struggle is also a kind of a kind of myth so there is a mythical background but i agree with you that it's different i mean we're, we're dealing here with myths that are not only about peoples but myths that animate states to do big dramatic things yeah how, how much of a role did plato's republic plato's republic play in hitler's planning for the third reich because if you Plato, in a lot of ways, has been accused by a number of philosophers as being sort of the first facet fascist. You know, I mean, if you read that his plan for society, where you know certain babies are left out to be exposed because they just don't fit into the society, and et cetera, et cetera, it's a pretty. I don't think any of us would want to live in Plato's Republic. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm with you there. I, 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 I don't. I wouldn't say there's any direct influence. Hitler's view of the world was pretty impoverished, and his his influences were pretty much coming straight out of the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. And essentially, he saw the world as this kind of biological struggle. Mm -hmm. So it was a sort of pseudo scientific thing. The, the Nazis did have this general idea that they were the Greeks of the present day, um, but that doesn't mean that you know that that they were actually reading Plato. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> you're not going to blame the Holocaust on Plato, uh, Professor. No, comment, they, um, you're right. I'm not. <laughs> I, I mentioned a second ago. I uh, this past summer, I took my grandson through Europe. 
and we did uh, spend time in Poland, and we went to Krakow and Auschwitz and so forth. Um, when you have guides, and when Polish guides, you have even German guides. Uh, we went through Berlin, Paris. Uh, the word you never hear if your focus is World War II never is too strong a word, but I'm just wondering what your reaction is. We never heard the word German. We heard a lot of words like Nazi, the SS, the Wehrmacht. Um, And there was a, struck me as even among the victim nations, a very conscious attitude to avoid putting any label on an existing nation, which is Germany. And so uh, we've already talked a bit. We've touched on this idea of apologies and, gee, I wish that hadn't happened. But whenever you think about something that's recurred here a number of times, could it happen again? Well, maybe not the Nazis, but we do have a nation that seems, and this is a matter of endless controversy, seems to have tolerated and been and accommodated, in fact, the extermination of the Jews. I was always impressed by the book, the Hitler's Willing Executioners. And I must say my, my history at Citibank, I had a lot to do with Germany and a big organization we had there that was reporting to me. And we did get, again, over the third Stein into these kinds of subjects. The reaction was almost always the same. I, I, I'll stop and just ask you if... Uh, I guess what I'm asking you is the consciousness, the, the conscience of the German nation today. People like myself who were alive then, if not directly involved then. Okay. The I, I guess the way the way that I see that is that the the the, the policies were certainly German policies. Uh, the war was a German war, and we can be polite and speak about Nazis or speak about SS men, but that's fundamentally inaccurate because many of the perpetrators were not in the Nazi party, and the vast majority of them did not belong to to the SS. So, if a, if a Polish guide, you know, out of politeness or out of the desire not to mention or blame a whole nation. Um, doesn't use the word Germans. In a way, it's keeping, it's minimalizing the thing, which is why I, I do use the word German and Germans in my book. Not to say that all Germans were to blame or that a German nation was collectively to blame, but because insofar as one could ever use those sorts of adjectives, they apply to this. You know, if there's anything that's, if you if you don't think the war was German or the policies were German, then the word German can just be, can be thrown out the window com- completely. That said, um, it, it wasn't only Germans, and and this is where you know one has to start thinking about about human behavior. That it was a German policy, it was a German idea, but um, the majority of people who took part in, for example, the Holocaust were probably not Germans, not the important people. Again, not the decision makers, not the people who were in charge, not the people who were the coloni- the colonizers, but of the actual killers, probably most people were not German. And you know, during the time of the Second World War, there was a, an autonomous Romanian policy to kill Jews and a quasi-autonomous mm-hmm. Croatian policy to kill Jews. And what this tells us, unfortunately, is that you, however you explain the Holocaust, it can't be by reference just to some particular German proclivity. It, it was the Germans who did it. But unfortunately, the lesson can't be that only one nation uh, was capable of this. That, for me, would be too optimistic a lesson. Now, I'm getting to your actual question because I think what's important for the development of a, of, a, of, a, of a kind of useful, positive historical national consciousness is, is a sense of responsibility. You know, that, that the Germans, and the Germans are unusual in this, actually do believe that it's important for them to take responsibility for th- these crimes in their, in their immediate past. And I wouldn't want to speak about, you know, every German everywhere, but I would say that in general, the Germans have done a better job trying to come to terms with and trying to and trying to keep alive the history of this particular period than anyone else has done. You know, you can say, well, they have more to they have more to think about than other people, and that's that's perhaps true. But I do think this the, the state of German historical consciousness is pretty good. More than that, I would say that German national 
identity is actually to some extent based upon this idea that you have to reflect on the past, not on the past as a heroic past, but on the past as, as something which has to be uh, considered as a, as, as, as a time of moral failure. Do you have any thoughts in that respect about the Japanese? Sorry, about the what? The Japanese. I'm I'm less qualified to say anything because I haven't worked on it. I mean, it, it yeah, seems no, very I, I clear that, re- that the, that the way, Japanese you, did, did, ten times have not aware. come to that kind of conclusion about their own past. They did not. The Japanese have not. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, I I did a tour of the Pacific Islands last year because I was a former Marine, and uh, it was amazing the degree to which that country is apparently still in denial but that's not our subject here and i i I understand that (laughs) well Well, in a a way it is i mean i I appreciate the question though because i think um i think it does and it should a book like this and things should put on notice a country like japan i've always had a beef with japan for for not coming clean with what they did in korea and in uh, manchuria etc you know and isn't i mean isn't that the point is to say that you know Part of the reason why Germany has had to reflect on its history so much and has had to deal with the Holocaust is because the world has put them on notice. You know, to a certain extent, we've let the Japanese, we haven't put as much focus on those incidents, and we haven't put as much focus on what happened under I, Stalin. I had, yeah, I had a, um, a Korean man just, uh, tell me that one of the reasons that the Japanese have not <clears throat> um, been taken to task is because in to, to the Chinese and to the Korean mind, the idea was that they were not in some ways prepared for the Japanese aggression and it was their fault in a way and that'll never happen again. I remember uh, I had a Korean man say that in our mind we we kind of blame ourselves for not being ready and knowing that there was a there was a you know a A tiger at the gates. Yeah in that sense that's a different a different way but you know Fats I'll tell you something as as hard as this book was to read in the in terms of just the the scale of human suffering and you make it very personal and it's it was very moving i have to say that it's also i felt very optimistic about the power of the human spirit not to get too you know but but it it really in a way is is an ode to that uh it pays homage to the fact that well guess what the the russians are still here the ukraine is still you know there are still people doing great things in Ukraine, and 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 regardless of what happened and how horrible it was, man, they the human beings are still kicking. It's 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 kind of amazing how you just can't somehow you can change things, you can keep things under the rug, but somehow, you know, a new generation comes along. And, Pro- you know, Professor yeah. Snyder, my son cuts this off at an hour, and I'm looking at a clock here. And thinking, no, we got time. We got time. I I, I, I want to ask you though. Reaction to the book. Uh, hard, hard to imagine an author getting a more positive um, set of reviews. There were, there were a couple of critical reviews um, that you, that you would be aware of. Um, and w- what is your reaction to how the book has been received generally? Well, I mean, for, first of all. I, I should say that for, for me, the, 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 hist- the history itself is much more important than, um, you know, re- reviews here or there. So for me, the most important thing about the book is that people read it. I mean, that was the most surprising thing in a way and the most important thing that it's had such a readership, you know, that it, it cracked the New York Times bestseller list and it cracked bestseller lists in other countries and that I get to hear from people all over the world every every day about the book. That that to me is the extraordinary thing, and that's that's the humbling thing. Um, it, it, and then in, intellectually, it's also been really wonderful because I, I've been struck that whether people are in California or in Warsaw, they do. Everybody seems to have a way into this book, which is what I really intended. I didn't want it to be a history where only Jews could understand it, or only Russians could understand it, or only Poles, mm-hmm. which is unfortunately the way history often is, or only Americans. I wanted it to be a history where um, people from their various perspectives could find a way in. Some things would be more familiar, some things less, but the whole would seem to make sense. And almost all of the email that I get, you know, which is the way that one can test these things, I, I get a lot of email about this book says that um, you've made this comprehensible for me you or you've brought some I, as to the as to the critical stuff I mean it the, the, there 
The main tendency, I think, is to try to keep history smaller rather rather than bigger. There is, I mean, there's a kind of defensive wish to keep German history inside Germany Mm -hmm. or to keep Jewish history inside Israel or to keep Polish history inside Poland. And I, I guess a long time ago, I came to the, to the realization, you know, I might be wrong, but, but I came to the realization, which for me has been productive and fruitful, that you can't understand even Jewish history or Polish history, or Ukrainian history, what have you, without going beyond the framework of a given nation, that if you just stay within a given nation, you'll, you'll miss certain things. And in a way, you'll repeat the mistakes of the people that you're studying. You know, if, if you stay within one ethnic or one political framework, you, you're, you're in a way forcing yourself to accept um, a political and ethnic framework of the past. When I think as historians, what we have to do is be universalists. I mean, we accept the force of the nation. We accept the significance of the state. But the his- history, I think, has to be about everybody or else it's, it's actually about, about nobody. Now, that's not how most people do history. Although I think it's close to how most people would say they do history. And I think the, 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 what the reactions against the book have in common is a desire to keep history small or, or mm-hmm. framed in ways which I, I no longer think is possible. And I think that you, you talked you about talked how about in America... America. Our, our sound, sound is so is, bad right now. Yeah. Um, you up. talked about how in America there's a tendency to try and just teach kids one thing, right? That that's all Americans can handle. And, you know, the response has been to make, you know, the 20th century, the big lesson of the 20th century, the Holocaust, which does keep it singular. And isn't the big lesson of the 20th century, you know, the importance of worldview, the importance of beliefs and the degree to which if you have a set of beliefs that are exclusive and that say that you have truth with a capital T, you will go to hell. You will lead you will go down a path that leads to the bloodlands or something like it. That I, I'd be happy to I'd be happy to sign on to that. I, I I I am I am you know as a father of a kindergartner myself. I I am I am humble about the possibility the possibilities of teaching children history. I, I think it's I think it's really hard, mm-hmm. and I'm sympathetic to the tendency to to choose one object lesson or one example over others. The the idea that you're trying to get across is I think fundamentally correct and deep and useful and, and, and true, but I don't think it's an easy one to teach. It's the kind of idea that you kind of come to by by elimination, right? I mean, you mm-hmm. learn about a bunch of different cases, you learn about a bunch of different disasters, and then you see something that they have in common. And and that's tough, you know, that's tough. I, I, I Of course I think the 20th century should be taught in a broad way. I mean, I, I personally think the Holocaust has to be at the center of, of the history of the 20th century, at least in the West. But of course I think you can't really teach history around any one event because the problem is if if that one event doesn't then seem to apply, then you're totally lost. Mm-hmm. You don't have anything to refer to. So I'm, I'm a big advocate of traditional chronological history um, of the kind that I tried to write in Bloodlands, you know, where, where I'm hopeful that, that, that younger people can all can can follow it and can can learn something from it. I, I, so, I mean, better. It's a tough call. I mean, much better the Holocaust than nothing at all, right? right. But ideally, the Holocaust as part of a history which has steps, which has um, which has years, which has dates, which has other stories where people can feel like that history is going on. That it's not just some. It's not an example behind plexiglass in the past sort of staring at you, but a history in which we're, which we're actually inhabiting. And for that, I think you need not just an event, you need, you need some kind of progressive story. Well, I think that the progressive story, though, is the alternative. It's one thing to teach history. You also have to teach the alternative. I, I think that's why it's so important to make the argument for why the Founding Fathers solved the political problem, why the Constitution at the end of the day is, I think your alternative to these other, you know, p- philosophical and political commitment is one thing. But, you know, it better be a verb to an extent. You know, again, you fall into these, you, you can be politically and philosophically, philosophically committed, but, in, 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 but still in the wrong, with the wrong ideas. I think that w- what's just as important is teaching why the Constitution and why personal liberty should be the held up as the most important thing to avoid the alternative to 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 avoid the, uh, going down the wrong path 
don't you think that's important as well? Don't you think that that's the that's the argument here for in, in a lot in the indirect argument in some ways for the for me, and this book is a classic example of why the founding fathers had it right. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, I'm I, I, I'm willing to go along with that at least to a point. I, I, I certainly think that what you you need to have not just a document like the Constitution, but you need to have institutions which grow from that Constitution, which reinforce uh, plurality, which which allow you to have your convictions and me to have my convictions and allow us to have a way of resolving our disputes, which is not force. Mm. I think that I think that's really that's really important. And it doesn't come from nowhere. You know, mm. it, it's a very difficult thing to construct historically. Americans are very fortunate insofar as we have those those kinds of institutions and, and traditions and they can fall apart pretty easily it's a pretty difficult balance i think we often take for granted that these institutions and this constitution are a part of the natural order which they're not I mean, they're mm -hmm. very they're very they're very easy to topple right. but i think there's something else which is that we have to remember that we we live in a world of uh, we live in a world of scarcity and and the dispute between me and you might today be about ideas but if tomorrow it's also about water supply then you know that that conflict over water supply and that com is going to make that conflict over ideas much harder to to settle so i think we also have to remember that a lesson of the middle of the 20th century is that scarcity and perceived scarcity make certain kinds of ideas much more attractive and they make the kinds of ideas that we're talking about pluralism and 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 an individual freedom and democracy seem weak and inadequate well that's, that's uh, also that's part of the we're, lesson we're, of the 30s and 40s yeah we're biological my friend used to always say if you you know you're an easygoing guy miss a meal and 4 hours of sleep come talk to me and see how you're feeling you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's that simple. You know, I got a kindergartner as well, and if I thought that you were trying to teach my kindergartner the wrong lessons about life, or she couldn't get enough to eat, it'd probably get pretty ugly. You know, <laughs> and, and you're right. I mean, that's unfortunately, I I just as I get older and I have children, I I just it's amazing how fragile everything is. Uh, you know, I just feel like everything is fragile. You know, the water supply and food and all those things, man. It's, it's Professor Snyder, I have a last question, if I may. I, you now have earned a very large audience. So whatever you publish after Bloodlands is going to be almost immediately drawing um, a large readership. So the question is, what are we working on now? <laughs> In Vienna. I'm sorry, I, I missed that one completely. He, he said, sorry, because oh. the sound is bad. He said, uh, but essentially, you, you, you've, you've developed a, a big following, and your next book is sure to be read by a lot of people. What are you working on now? Oh, you know, I, I, I mean, one reason I appreciate this conversation is I'm working on the kind of thing that we've been talking about. I'm trying to write a, a history which is just a history of the Holocaust of the Jews, but at the same time is a, is a global history which begins from the way that Hitler saw the world, so that the sorts of Darwinist ideas we were talking about, hmm. and, um, and goes through the destruction of states, so the destruction of institutions in places like Poland, which you asked me about earlier, um, how the destruction of institutions and the end of political traditions enables, enables killing of Jews and others, and takes the story through uh, the present day. So it doesn't end with a kind of... Uh, conception of morality and decency the way that Bloodlands does, but tries to consider what the history of the Holocaust actually means for the, the 21st century, not just the present, but as we look ahead to things that might be coming down the road, as we begin to feel the, the fragility and the scarcity, as the future starts to seem not like something which is a horizon of possibility, but which is a kind of, a kind of claustrophobic, um, a kind of claustrophobic cloak which is falling over us. What this all means for the 21st century. So it's a it's a it's a history which is similar, but which is in a way much much bigger and, and more ambitious. That's what I'm trying to do here in Vienna. Um, and and then when I do that, I'm going to change the subject completely. <laughs> <laughs> You're a special man, and we appreciate. I I, I, I I just like to say that I, I consider it a privilege to talk to somebody who's made such a great contribution. I know you hear a lot of that, and it probably washes over like water in a shower and so forth, but. But I, I think the contribution has been enormous. I think the book, in my conversations, in the last two or three years, the book has come up innumerable times and will continue to do so. So none of us can measure the contribution, uh, but it has, been, it has been a very great contribution. 
and I would thank you for it. I would second that, Senator. And I would third it. There you go. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, well, keep up the great work. Uh, the book is Bloodlands Europe Between Hitler and Stalin by Professor Timothy Snyder. And uh, you're a stud. You're a stud uh, intellectually. <laughs> if, we could, if we could open your brain, it'd be just, it'd just be... A lot of muscle. Cock diesel. <laughs> cock diesel. And a lot of hard work. <laughs> a lot of hard work. <laughs> and uh, many thanks to Big Mike uh, for, for your questions. And uh, sorry about the sound, everybody, but that's how, that's how it goes. I'm tempted to give you guys my, um, my stand-up dates, but I just feel like the, the subject matter <laughs> of 14 million people dying and my stand-up, it's kind of an insult. So we're just going to end this with uh, a big thank you to Timothy. Snyder. I think that's a good judgment. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) All right, man. Enjoy. Enjoy Vienna. I'm jealous. We're we're in L.A. Thank you. (laughs) The wasteland. Thanks, Timothy. Okay. Be well. Thanks. You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show. Be sure to visit briancallen.com for information about this episode as well as past and future episodes. You can follow Brian on Twitter at Brian Callen and like him on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash briancallencomedy. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.